We've got to transform our energy system away from fossil fuel, cut greenhouse gas emissions, move to energy efficiency, move to sustainable energy. It is overwhelming, the science. Overwhelming. It's not even a question. The science is overwhelming, says Beckel. But overwhelming about what exactly? Certainly... I agree with Beckel. He says it's overwhelming that the Earth is warming. Most scientists agree about that. That's why we have this graph in my office. Um, but, you know, just in case. But Beckel also believes that man is the cause of the warming. Is the science settled about that? Climate changes. Always has, always will. It changed before man. Is man causing it now? Is global warming a crisis? And can we do anything about it? Those are the big questions. So let's have a debate about that. Roy Spencer is a climatologist at the University of Alabama. He's skeptical about man causing global warming. Uh, to debate him, we have, well, actually, we have an empty chair. We ask a dozen scientists who are concerned about man causing global warming to debate Roy. Most refuse. The Union of Concerned Scientists says that debating you, Roy, would be doing the public a disservice because it would give your extreme ideas credibility. So what do you say to that? It's, it's how you're portrayed as this wacky extremist. Well, as you've already mentioned, John, I, I don't deny that there's been warming. In fact, I don't even deny that some of the warming uh, is due to mankind. What I deny is that we have any clue how much of the warming, whether it's 10% or 90%, I don't think we have a clue. All right, so before we hear from you, I want to hear from both sides on this issue. So we did find a scientist who was alarmed about man causing global warming, who was willing to talk about this as long as it was not a debate. So, Roy, get lost. Go away if you would take a seat over there, and let's welcome NASA scientist Gavin Schmidt. Dr. Schmidt, come on in. You work for the Goddard... I work for NASA. the Goddard Institute for Space Studies, uh, which is a NASA offshoot in New York City. All right, so why is Roy Spencer wrong in saying we're not sure about man causing it? So you made a good point earlier on. You said that climate changes all the time. It has, and it has done for many, many different reasons. It's changed because we've had big volcanoes. It's changed because the sun has changed. It's changed because there have been orbital wobbles uh, in the Earth's path around the sun that has caused like, ice ages to come and go. All of those things are totally true. So we've looked, we've looked at the sun. It's not the sun. We've looked at volcanoes. It's not volcanoes. We've looked at the orbit. It's not, what, it's not the orbit. This we've time, it's not those right. things. Uh, but what we've been doing the last 150 years is we've been increasing the amount of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, over 40% in terms of carbon dioxide. We've more than doubled the amount of methane, which is another greenhouse gas. And the signatures of those changes are very, very clear all the way through the system. Assuming this is true, why is it necessarily a problem? Warmer might be better. More people die from cold than warmth. We have built a society and an agricultural system and cities and everything that we do based on assumptions that basically the climate is not going to change. The fact that we have so much uh, infrastructure right near the shore is, is because we didn't expect the sea level to rise. The damage that we had from Hurricane Sandy was increased because sea level has increased by you know, 10 to 12 inches in this right. area. President uh, over, Obama over says wildfires are increasing, hurricanes are increasing, drought. Is this true? I, I thought these things have always happened, and this is alarmism. You agree with that? So there are some things that we can look at and we can say, okay, they're changing. Heat waves. Uh, we're having more extreme heat waves over a wider area. Uh, hurricanes, much more... you mentioned Sandy. Okay, hurricanes, there's more uh, uncertainty in the science of hurricanes. Are they because... increasing? It's a, it's a tricky thing, hurricanes. Like, I mean, they have this graph of hurricanes by decade, and they, they don't show an increase. Right, so I didn't, I didn't say they did. But we're seeing more intense rainfall. That's very clear over the whole of the U.S., over Europe, and in, uh, and in, other, and in other places as well. And now, what's going on in the future, that's where we're concerned about. Because so what, we're what doing, can we do? What can, if, if well, we... well, what we're doing right now is not nothing. What we're doing right now is we're increasing the amount of carbon dioxide every year, year on year. What can we do about it? We, well, we like burning fossil fuels. No, you, 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 know, you know what? You like the product of burning fossil fuels. Like you mentioned before, earlier on, about how dirty the air was when there was unrestricted burning of coal. Right? We don't like actually burning coal. What we like is the energy that comes from coal. 
right? What we like is energy. Yeah, and we like energy. And even if we cut our emissions in half, it right. wouldn't affect the world. Oh, it would. If, you cut your, if we cut our emissions by it would half... Be, it would be a tenth of the world's CO2. Well, and we're not going to cut it in half. Well, eventually we will, because eventually this is going to be a problem that is so large that we will transition to a more but renewable... But China market. isn't cutting, India isn't cutting. Cut. That's a big problem, and they're not going to take a lead on this because we haven't taken a lead but on But why it. should we make poor people suffer? I don't say you shouldn't make poor people if suffer. You make Fuel costs more, that hurts poor people. Then you give it back as a rebate. And you make people understand that what we need to do is move off carbon sources of fuel. I'm not qualified to debate you climatologists. Why won't you debate Roy Spencer? He's not a flake. He, he helped produce the data that... that the government uses for the I, atmospheric temperatures. I'm, 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 not a, I'm not a politician. You know, I'm here because you asked me to come on and talk about the science, and I am totally happy to do that. And any time you want to ask me again, just give me a call and I will come here and I will tell you about the science and I will point you in the right direction. But I'm not interested in doing this because it's good TV. I'm interested because what we have discovered as a scientific community uh, needs to be talked about. And you need to talk about it, and Roy needs to talk about it, and all these people need to talk about it. But I don't need to be arguing with people just to make good TV. Thank you, Gavin Schmidt. I appreciate you coming in. I would love to have you back. And if you would give the chair up again, let's bring Roy Spencer in to reply to what you said. Or stay, if you like. I'm not interested. But thank you very much. Dr. Spencer, can you... So, what do you say to what he says? Well, Gavin said quite a bit. Uh, I agree with some of what he says. Um, I speak out because I believe that forcing unrealistic, expensive energy solutions upon the poor it, is going to kill people. We know that poverty kills. That's not theoretical. It happens today. I would rather save people today from poverty than theoretically save people in the future. You've also said that carbon dioxide can make the planet greener? Well, that's pretty well understood. There's hundreds of papers that have been published by plant physiologists that show that increasing CO2 is good for basically all the plants that they study, even crops like uh, corn. My long-term prediction is that eventually we're going to realize that more CO2 in the atmosphere is actually a good thing. And considering the fact that it is necessary for life on Earth to have CO2 in the atmosphere, it's amazing how little there is in the atmosphere. The perception among my friends here in New York is that you're this weird outlier. And all the other serious scientists say, man's doing it. We've got to fix it now. Well, I hate to say it, but that's, you know, a, a characterization that's come, a, come about because of the media. I mean, people like Al Gore portray people like me as fringe and when, in fact... He, he I, won't debate anybody well, either. Well, no, of course not. I consider my views pretty mainstream, and uh, I know there's a in lot of... In climatology, you find a lot of people who I agree find with a you. lot of people that agree with me but will not speak out because they're afraid that they might lose their funding. All you hear from on the other side from me are scientists who have decided to take a stand uh, publicly, uh, get involved with the politicians, and... And if you say this is a big problem, that's when you get money to oh, fix sure. the problem. Yeah, Congress doesn't give money out for things that are not problems. I'm told we're destroying the earth, burning gas, oil, and coal, and we burn more than other countries. The National Audubon Society says there is no greater threat to our environment. But my next guest, scientific journalist Matt Ridley, says the opposite is true. Matt, how can that be the case? Well, uh, if you think about it, when we're burning fossil fuels, it means we're not burning something else. We're not bur cutting down forests and so on. Uh, and the more we burn fossil fuels, the more we can uh, produce fertilizer. And that means we use less land to grow our food so we can spare land for forests. So there's actually a net forest increase in a lot of the world, particularly America. But over and above that, there's a fascinating new discovery, which is that the world as a whole is getting greener. Places like the Amazon rainforest are actually getting greener. And the reason is partly because we're putting more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, and that makes plants grow faster. All right, so let's break that down. In general, there is less farmland and more land returned to forest 
because we burn oil, coal instead of trees. New England used to be 70% farmland. It's now 70% forest. Countries like Bangladesh are growing more forest. There's a new satellite which measures the, the greening of the earth, and it's finding that about 20% of the earth is getting greener and 3% is getting browner, uh, and, the, and about half of that effect is coming from the carbon dioxide that we're putting into the air from burning fossil fuels. So literally, the burning of fossil fuels is helping the rainforest in the Amazon to grow. Now, you know, that's a very unwelcome message for the environmental movement. It just happens to be true. There's a very nice example of this, which is the uh, the border between Haiti and the Dominican Republic. Uh, the Dominican Republic is pretty green. Haiti is very brown. Uh, Haiti is almost totally deforested. The reason is because they use charcoal. You can even see a charcoal. clear line the, the, between the two countries, just looking from the satellites. Yeah, one's you, green, you one's can see brown. it on a satellite. You can see it in, in an aerial photograph. And, and the reason is because Haiti relies on wood for, for not only domestic fuel, but for industrial fuel, too, whereas the Dominican Republic uses fossil fuels, and it actually Sub subsidizes the use of propane as a cooking fuel so that people won't go out into the forest and cut down trees to make charcoal to cook over. So there's a very clear example of how the, the, the use of fossil fuels is actually good for the environment. And the propane comes from the natural gas, which we're discovering much more of. Uh, of course, it would That's be right. better in terms of global warming, if it really is a threat, if we could burn less oil and use more wind power or solar power, perhaps. But it's such a joke when you look at our current energy use. We have a graph of that. I don't think people know that three-fourths of our energy comes from those horrible fossil fuels. Uh, nuclear is 10 percent. Wind and solar are a tiny fraction. I left out hydropower, which is one of the best. But we're, we're nowhere close to getting rid of fossil fuels. That's right. And, and, I mean, wind is just an irrelevance in this argument. People go on and on about how it saves the, the, the planet. Actually, it needs a huge amount of landscape. Even if we carpeted the whole of Australia with wind turbines, we still wouldn't be able to make much of, of a difference. So a lot of these renewables are really not making a dent in the problem. The public doesn't buy this at all. How come? Well, the, we've spent so long demonizing fossil fuels over the last few decades that no wonder people think that they're the root of all evil. But, you know, when you think about it, it's not even just the environment. Things like slavery, you know, because we made energy cheap, it became possible to get rid of slavery. You know, so the, the humanitarian effects of, of what, cheap what, energy uh, are very important. Slow cheap, down. Cheap. How, how did cheap energy help end slavery? Because you use machines instead of people, basically. You know, once, once energy is cheap, you, you, you invent more machinery, you, you have factories running. And they're, they're saying, look, hang on, this is cheaper than hiring lots of people. You know, so it does actually, uh, on the whole, it, it undermines also uh, getting cheap energy. You either have cheap labor or you have cheap energy. And basically, it's nicer for people if we have cheap energy. Thank you, Matt Ridley, for that unconventional wisdom.